Hey guys, I'm Naya and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm joined by one of the most renowned people in the Yu-Gi-Oh! community arguably. I'm joined by an amazing player, deck builder, innovator, D1 and only Jeff Jones. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you. I cannot wait to talk to you about everything deck building for today. However, I would love to feature you more. <laughs> I mean, I think you are an incredible mind in this community and whenever I get a chance to have you on the channel, I will make sure to do it. So <laughs> today, <laughs> today we're going to talk about deck building. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, I think you're known for a lot of things, but that would be one of them. So I just prepared a couple, you know, topics, questions to basically give players a bit of an idea, a bit of a perspective. What's it like to actually approach it? Because a lot of people like to, um, you know, like to throw shade at, I don't know, stealing people deck lists. Like the, mm -hmm. that's, that's a thing, obviously. And I guess I just want to, you know, talk about how maybe that's not exactly an issue if you don't know where to begin. And I think that the type of content we're making right now is a good resource for people to sort of like to go around that and to actually help them be good deck builders themselves and not get into the predicament of someone going, oh, you stole another people, uh, another person's deck list. So, um, yeah. I guess before we get started, I just want to hear a couple words, you know, about your, I guess, history in Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, how did you get started, get into it, get interested? So I am, I am very old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, right. I've been playing Yu-Gi-Oh! since <laughs> its inception. Um, and uh, I started out just like a lot of people. Well, maybe not so many people anymore, but mm -hmm. um, it was just, I used to play card games like Pokemon, and uh, one day I had come home from school, and I turned on the TV, and Yu-Gi-Oh! was on, and it was the very first episode, and I was like, holy crap, what is this? This is so cool. <laughs> and when my dad got home from work, I made him take me to the card shop to see if they had Yu-Gi-Oh! cards, and oh he bought me my first starter decks, and... <laughs> uh, me and my brother and my for our first starter decks and kind of the rest is history um i just started playing and uh i have taken like a few breaks over the years i think i think a break is healthy especially mm -hmm. when you invest a lot of time into Yu-Gi-Oh. um it can be exhausting trying to go to all of the tournaments and just keep up and especially now that like i'm older it's even more exhausting so i went back mm -hmm. to back from mexico then right to ycs vegas mm -hmm. and I, I will never do a back-to-back -back ycs again i was so <laughs> tired and dead for like three days i did not recommend it um, <laughs> unless you unless you have like the stamina to do something like that but i, I do not anymore <laughs> <laughs> that's fair that's fair <laughs> but it's a very wholesome way to get started i think like the it, anime it was is, very wholesome yeah great yeah, it just really pulled a lot of people in. And of course, starting like from the beginning, you you went through a lot, you know, in the game. I've <laughs> I've been through every format of Yu-Gi-Oh! to ever exist. And I, I, I don't feel many people who still play the game can say that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's actually true. I mean, I think we need to address like the elephant in the room. We need to talk about Edison format. Like, sure. what, just what are some of your fondest memories? Like, what are some of the, I guess, things you can tell me about that time since you are so connected? Like, you are literally this, like, you are the soul <laughs> of Edison. Right. <laughs> so something I think is interesting before I jump into, like, memories is how right. much has changed. Because mm -hmm. Edison format was very short. It was only that one event. That's why it's called the Edison format. Yes. And there wasn't a lot of time to prepare for that event mm -hmm. um and now people can spend hours or months or, or years developing decks and decks are just so different now because they're so more refined you have that time and so things are just way different so the mm -hmm. deck that i won with now that i look back at it and look at it now is not even close to being as good as i thought it was at the time um That's so, so people have been able to make like all these decks like black wings is probably like the most powerful or mm -hmm. um like but a lot of people think it's like the best deck in that format now. Mm -hmm. And when I first heard that, this was like, so I don't really play a lot of Edison format. I do have like an updated version of my Edison deck to play for fun sometimes. But mm -hmm. when other people play it and they tell me originally that like, oh, like Black is one of the best deck. And I'm like, really? I beat like three of that deck at that YCS <laughs> and I don't remember it being that good but now the decks are more refined mm -hmm. and uh they're able to uh, they're they're just better and i think also something to take into account is online resources are much more abundant to people and back then 
that was like not a thing. Mm-hmm. It is so much easier now to, for decks to become fully refined mm-hmm. because of the way the internet works. People can communicate more. Uh, there's lots of different ways to play Yu-Gi-Oh uh, online if you want to. Um, and because of that, because of like the communication of players and stuff, things get solved much quicker than they would back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, back then, it was really easy to for small groups of people to take advantage of the lack of knowledge and go into a tournament and just completely blow everyone out because not everyone had access to that knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now that's not the case. It's just so easy. for. It's really hard to keep a secret in Yu-Gi-Oh! now. If you have something really good... It's very. It's just very hard to do that. Um, um, let me ask you something. Uh, uh, I want you to be so honest. What do you prefer from a personal perspective? Like being like in the old in the old days, <laughs> you could put it like you know of like mm-hmm. you said when there wasn't a lot of information, or right now when everything is shared pretty much. Um. So when people <laughs> don't have a a long period of time to optimize decks that's when i thrive because i can more quickly Mm -hmm. put pieces of puzzles together Mm -hmm. to figure out what works um right so at at edison there wasn't a lot of time to prepare for that that event Mm -hmm. and because i was very good at deck building i was able to put something together very quickly in a short amount of time that worked while other people's decks were not as refined Mm -hmm. and i think uh, again, I went on later to win uh, one of the most important tr- important tournaments for me was uh, the, the UDS, where I won the mm-hmm. UDS belt. And at that tournament, there was a ban list the week before, mm-hmm. and a lot of people went into that tournament not knowing what to run. And I very easily figured out that this has to be the best deck, and it was Pendulum Magicians. And I went in, and I lost one match the entire tournament. And I think that match, I actually forfeited to... Uh, help someone else so um uh, (laughs) that's not even a loss yeah that doesn't count (laughs) yeah yeah there might have been another loss but i can't really remember it was like a couple years ago or Mm -hmm. it was like four years four years ago now but um yeah i just uh so in that aspect i do enjoy the past where it was like harder for people to come up with information but i think i prefer more modernized Yu-Gi-Oh as a whole Mm -hmm. rather to like old old formats so a lot of people are very surprised when I tell them I don't really have a lot of fondness for old Yu-Gi-Oh I've lived through them I've played them I'm over it whereas a lot of people now they didn't get to experience that so it is fun for them and that's why a lot of people enjoy Edison they didn't Mm -hmm. get to play that format exactly for me I'm like oh I was there I've done it yeah yeah that's it (laughs) No, yeah, it's it's a totally different vibe. Like, literally right now, I think it's amazing with older formats. The second Konami started, like, you know, putting out reprints, pushing older formats. And also, like, to be perfectly honest, when Tier Lemons came out <laughs> and everyone was like, uh, are there any alternative formats we can go to? <laughs> uh, you know, everyone turned to that. Um, but yeah, and like me, my, like, I, I was, you know, T- little <laughs> when when Edison, little. Was, <laughs> when Edison was a thing uh, and I only started playing in 2017 so I don't have much of a much of a past and then me and my husband are building Edison decks like with old prints and all of that and like having the mm-hmm. whole vibe uh, so I totally understand what you mean and um but yeah I guess it's it's different being there and um I agree with you looking at like from the general point of view of course right now with sharing the information and all of that that's incredible um but you know, there's something there's something very personal about being the one the one person that like you know deck builds and innovates and does something, and yeah. like, no one can take that away from you. So of course, of course, it's great to 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 be proud of that, you know. So yeah, and I and I and I am proud of that that I've been able mm-hmm. to make lots of different decks in in the past that have been influential in, in formats. Yes, and I think the one thing that makes me the saddest about current Yu Gi Oh mm-hmm. is how uh, it's very hard to be innovative because a lot of decks start to build themselves. And mm-hmm. because of that, you have things like, I mean, well, for we, we always talk about like tier elements where you just like yeah. have 30 tier element cards in your deck, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so it, it, it's really hard to be innovative when that is the, the case because so many decks just build themselves now Mm -hmm. and i think it's really cool when certain decks do well 
that I think the I think the most the time when you can be innovative in Yu-Gi-Oh is when you can combine different aspects of cards or decks mm-hmm. to make them work. Mm-hmm. And that's been more and more difficult over the years. But I'm sure it's happened more recently than I can remember. I'm trying to think if there's like a deck that, oh, I never even thought about that. But um, mm. I think maybe, like, I think, like, like this is like probably a poor example, but uh, there was a European YCS where the mm-hmm. Rika deck did very well. Yeah. And uh, it used like the adventure cards and stuff like that. And while I don't think Rika in itself is very or it was like Rico Sonavalon. It's very like innovative because so yeah. many of the uh, cards just kind of like insert themselves into the deck because mm-hmm. they're Rico cards and needed. But mm-hmm. I think the combination of all the things is what made that unique and was very cool. Um, oh, for sure, yeah, and it was a great event to play Rika at. I think with like, and I'm I'm not saying it's what carried the deck, but cards like Mystic Mind and Rivalry they played a huge part. Oh, like, sure, sometimes, sure, yeah. you know, a deck is just able to do well with with the other tech cards, and I don't think that's an issue at all. I think it's just you know smart deck choice on the person's mm-hmm. part. So even if it's not the deck itself is not as innovative, but speaking of innovative decks, is there any, like any deck in particular in the last couple of years, like um, maybe excluding the Pendulum Magician deck that you mentioned that you really like enjoyed and felt like there was a lot to do with it, uh, or just I guess a deck that you came up with or something like that in the recent years. In recent years, hmm, uh, probably. So I guess. I had a um, a branded tier limit deck that I was playing. Mm-hmm. This was before um, uh, like uh, Rukulos came out and stuff like that. Uh-huh. So before and Darkwing I took, Blast. Yeah. Before Darkwing Blast. Mm-hmm. And uh, me and uh, my partner, Max, we like had this like kind of secret version with other people in our group Mm -hmm. that used um branded and high spirits and we were trying to keep it very very like low key down low (laughs) and people might know about that now Mm -hmm. but at the time they definitely did not and so it's very funny because we spent like two months working on this deck and we would constantly like go on dueling book search if anyone was playing with Brandon and high spirits just to make sure no one had figured it out <laughs> like kidding. every day we'd make sure that there was no, no one was seeing it and then uh we would like go on uh, like zodiac duelist and type in the search bar like Brandon and high spirits to make sure no one was talking about <laughs> I it <love> and <laughs> um and uh w- Max and I both like topped two regionals in, in a row with it still keeping it like very on the down low mm-hmm and then our friend uh, Bowden uh, yeah. played it at, at Oceanics, right? his nationals or yeah. something. Yes. Yeah, and, and and topped with it, mm-hmm. and so like that was like very very cool that one of us was able to do well with it. But I was never really able to play it um, mm-hmm. at an event. Uh, so, but that was something that was very proud because we all worked on it together. That's amazing. Actually, that's very, very like uh, that period of time. I think is so sad because it was that short. Like mm, the second yeah. the Brandon High Spirits tech came out, and everyone, like every single one of us, was like jumping on it, and then Darkwing Blast came out, and we were like, yes. "Oh, <laughs> okay, I guess we're not doing that anymore." <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. So some people still tried to use it because yes. like mm-hmm. you were using Death Frog at first, but then yeah. like Rukulos came out, and that was just a better card. But mm-hmm. there were just like better versions of the deck to play without Predator and High Spirits. Yes, true, 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 true. And um, since I, I asked the question, I want to also know, like, overall, what was maybe something that you are most proud of when it comes to your uh, your innovations or uh, deck in particular? Most proud of? Mm-hmm. Hmm. If there's anything that you can, like, pinpoint and say that's <laughs> that's it, or a couple of them, whatever. No, um, I don't know if there's something I'm most proud of, but I think, I think I'm proud of the Grand Soil Psychic deck I was able to get second with, even mm-hmm. though it was not a good deck. I was like in a very, I had like just gotten out of a relationship at the out of the time, and I wasn't even going to go to that event. But my friends were like, "No, just go. We'll just have a good time." And I didn't play at all. I wasn't playing at all, and so I just like built this fun deck that week before the event, and then I just kept winning with it, and I didn't understand why. 
and eventually I just got second with it, and I think that was like a very cool thing. Uh, sorry, um, which event was that? Because I was not expecting off, to but... do well at all. Yeah. Uh, which event was that? Like the uh, it was the... YCS. It was a uh, YCS Toronto. Ah, uh, Toronto um, one. Okay. Yeah, many years ago, and it, yeah, it was like an Earth Psychic deck with Grand Soil, and it was very funny because no one knew what any of my cards did, and a lot of people would just keep reading them over and over again, <laughs> and then the Psychic deck has like numerous cards that let you gain life. So they take a long time mm-hmm. reading all my cards, and then we go to time, and I gain oh, a bunch of, of life course. in time. I mean, they did it to themselves. So yeah, it, well, yeah. not your like, fault. I'm like, but... it wasn't my intention. I had no <laughs> idea that was. It just kept happening. They were like, okay, well, they took thirty minutes to read all my cards a hundred <laughs> times. I guess I'll do this. And then like, one person didn't know what my cards did, so it took a long time. Then activated his solemn judgment, and then paid <gasps> no half his way. life, and then I gained a whole bunch of life. Also, so <sighs> the difference in life was just so much. I think that was like in top eight. I think that's a future uh, match, but oh my yeah, it was a. Uh, it was very, very silly. I mean, it wasn't your fault. You just brought a fun deck. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah. It was just supposed to be a fun deck. And then, yeah, the, the some of the cards were just very good. And then um, on top of that, yeah, the, the whole gaining life thing definitely worked out to my favor at that event. So um, do you actually, with all of your skills when it comes to deck building and Yu-Gi-Oh! in general, do you prefer a, a format where it's like highly diverse and you can innovate and you can do certain things or do you maybe prefer a format like tier and the tier zero format was where mm. those were very similar but you know skill mattered yeah i i will be one of the few notable like good players mm-hmm. to say that i do not like tier zero format i hate it's because because i play when i play Yu-Gi-Oh, the best part about Yu-Gi-Oh for me is building decks and when you can't do that it makes me it makes it feel pointless and it makes me not care about Yu-Gi-Oh. So yeah. if I can't build decks that I like to uh-huh. go to a tournament and try and do well, I just think what is the point? So okay. I much prefer decks or t- uh, formats where there are maybe four decks or something like that. Mm-hmm. Once you get past four decks, it can get kind of excessive mm-hmm. and I don't think it's very healthy because then you get to a place where uh if there are like six different decks you can't prepare for all of them. Exactly. You can maybe prepare for like half of them. And then you're just forced to take losses to the other ones. And I don't think that's particularly healthy. Exactly. Like it's what I'm saying. And people sometimes come at me and they're like, oh, well, why do you why do you say, you know, a format like three to four decks format or a tier zero format? Why do you say that's better? And it's simply because you cannot prepare for 20 decks. Like nationals mm. yes, last year, that was a pain. It was literally like just so scary to go into a, an event and be like, well, I don't know what I'm facing. I have no idea. Yeah. You know, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to prepare. And it just freaks me out personally. And I think a lot of people can agree with that. That's, you know, some don't, but. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I It can definitely be. The, the unknown is mm-hmm. like very anxiety inducing when you really care about Yu-Gi-Oh, right? Of course. Um, So if you like, if you are if you're trying to do well mm-hmm. and you're like, okay, you want to invest a lot of time into Yu-Gi-Oh, but mm-hmm. then at some point it comes down to like things you just can't control. You can't control what decks you're going to play exactly. against in, in that exactly. tournament, right? Exactly. Um, so since we are going into a bit of a more diverse format, even though Kashira is still um, quite overwhelming, what would be some, like, I guess, tips you would want to give to people that are preparing right now? Because- sure. Um, so this is going to be, so this is going to sound very pessimistic and, and sad, <laughs> but it's going to be a very frustrating format because yes. uh with Kashira, which we think we've seen to be the most dominant deck so far, yes, um, it has these issues where there are lots of different cards that work against it, mm-hmm. but all the cards that work against it don't always work well against it. Mm-hmm. So because of this, you have things like um, Lava Golem, Sphere Mode, Nibiru, uh, Book of Eclipse... Um, I don't know if I'm freaking anything. Those it are like the main fine. ones. Yeah. Um, and because of this, uh, something that me and uh, my teammates for the YCS Mexico were doing mm-hmm. uh, was we weren't doing the full Kashira board. Mm-hmm. And 
we just went a, a rise heart with three materials and then set a bunch of back row. So mm-hmm. things like Forbidden Lance, uh, Book of Moon, um, Infinite Impermanence. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at that point, we played it more like Zodiac, like mm-hmm. old format Zodiac, where you just go like Drident and a bunch of back row and mm-hmm. hand traps. <laughs> and that worked very well for us because so many people were using cards like Nibiru, Lava Golem, Sphere Mode, and mm-hmm. it made all of those cards dead. And then we could try to mitigate cards like Book of Eclipse uh, with things like Forbidden Lance. Mm -hmm. So the problem becomes that if people start doing that, which we've seen is starting to become the norm, Mm -hmm. it plays around the most amount of cards to play that way. And when you do that, uh, you would then have to start thinking, well, how do I build my deck accordingly? to if these cards lava golem spear mode nibiru are mm-hmm. not good and the answer to that probably is something like kaijus um and then if we go into the format like that right mm-hmm. and people start playing cards like kaijus or some sort of single removal that doesn't always lose to forbidden lance mm-hmm. uh we then start going to the reverse where uh, you if everyone is playing kaiju's, then you go ahead and you just go for the entire board again and lock exactly. all your opponent's zones. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be this infinite cycle of like rock paper scissors. Which cards well, you never you can never prepare because the correct cards because you never know which route your opponent is going to take with Kashira, mm-hmm. and it's going to be very frustrating to play because sometimes. I mean, if you go to prepare for your opponents just going a rice heart pass, and then they think, okay, well, I, if everyone's going to do that, then I'm just going to go the full board, and you have mm-hmm. kaijus in your deck, and then you get all your zones locked, and the one kaiju doesn't do anything. Exactly. Um, it's just, there's no real way to tackle every single avenue of the things that Kashira can do, which is the most frustrating part for me, and I think mm-hmm. a lot of other players who are um uh d- d- that do well like jesse have figured out very quickly yeah. is that there's no single card that works in every situation and because you played this rock paper scissors game it just is very frustrating to play against um so i told you i'd probably go off on a tangent no which I i'm did. so glad you did the, i literally just the, wanted to say this was the best explanation i appreciate the comparison to rock paper scissors so much it's it's literally i couldn't i couldn't agree more and it happened a lot i think with cards like nibiru is a is a card that oh that that always happens with it like people just start sleeping on nibiru and then everyone is summoning a lot and then one person comes with three nibiru in the main deck and they just literally annihilate everyone and it's always this this weird effect this bouncing off of one one thing yeah it's this back and forth of like Mm -hmm. oh nibiru's good now we can't summon five times and then nibiru sucks and then when people think nibiru sucks everyone starts summoning five times again and then nibiru is good yes and then it's so (laughs) weird it's certainly like Um, going in a circle (laughs) and that that is that's something that's very frustrating for me Mm -hmm. um as a player and Obviously, the original question is how would you help players prepare for this upcoming format? Mm-hmm. That it would be to <sighs> literally, I'm not when asking you to, to give Kashira, them an answer. It's very hard to yeah, give yeah, them an answer. Yes, it, it's very hard to give <laughs> them an answer because I don't think there is one. And and <laughs> yes. I and I think people who are as good as me or like better than me right now have also not figured out that answer. Mm-hmm. Um. So I think it comes down to if you're going to a big event or a big event for you, whether it be regionals or whatever, Mm -hmm. um, you have to make a game plan, stick to it, not try to cover like, or or I guess one thing you can do is you can try to cover all your bases Mm -hmm. and you can make your deck have like Nibiru, Lava Golem, Book of Eclipse, Kaijus. But then if you do that, it kind of makes it weird to where... um, it starts interfering with your deck because you have all these cards yes. to interact with your opponent, and you might not have enough engine to play after you deal with your opponent's board. Mm-hmm. So it's very it's very tricky mm-hmm. um, uh, to, to do something like that. But that would be my first place to start, would to be to try to 
it, find a deck that has enough engine to play while also being able to use a lot of these different combinations of these cards to hit all the different ways Kashira can play. Mm-hmm. And if you can't do that, then I would say stick to one way of beating Kashira and just try to make your deck the best as possible as you can. Because then it because and then not worry about it. And then if it happens, it happens. It was out of your control. You couldn't do anything about it because you can only prepare for so much. Mm-hmm. And as long as you understand right now that you can't prepare for everything, just prepare for what you can and then play the best you can. Well, that was very well. Put. If that if that if that makes sense, if that- it does. It honestly <laughs> does, and I'm a hundred percent sure it's gonna make sense to a lot of people because I think everyone is asking themselves right now, like, what can I do? Like, what am I supposed to do if I'm not trying to invest in Kashira? By the way, are you like, um, do you like um to invest in the best deck regardless? Um, do you like to play the best deck, or are you more so the person mm-hmm. that would would like choose um, an underdog or like you know a deck that counters the best strategy? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I I don't <coughs> think that w- if th- if this question was asked years ago, I would yeah. have said no. I don't really like playing the best deck. But as okay. I've gotten older and Yu Gi Oh has changed, sometimes you really don't have a choice. Um, when it comes to wanting to do well. Sometimes you just have to play the best deck. And then something for me, at least, is that if I'm playing the best deck, I can probably play it better than the majority of my opponents, which will give me an edge. Or I am able to figure out certain uh, intricacies or like tech cards to help beat the mirror, Mm -hmm. which makes me not so scared to play the decks that are the best decks. However, the innovator in me would love to play things that are mm-hmm. not the best X and try to d- do well with what I like. And before I took a break from Yu-Gi-Oh! post-COVID, so right, the 20, 2019 season is when I was playing the most. I think I topped like almost every event I played in that year. Mm-hmm. And then I stopped playing right at the end of 2019. And then COVID happened and I hadn't really started playing until uh, I'd say like the last six months. Uh, again now um but when like danger thunder was very very good mm-hmm. i just hated that deck <gasps> and i refused no to play way. it so i just so i just played things like sky striker and i topped a lot of sky striker yeah, and i, I played yeah. decks like like orcus and i really liked the orcus deck and i topped with the orcus deck too mm-hmm. um i because i think for me personally i feel best and most rewarded when i play the either control or mid-range decks uh-huh. and i'd prefer not to play combo decks so much uh which is why i would never play decks like goki uh and a big <laughs> a big issue for me with combo decks is when combo decks are good it makes beer matches very coin flippy because yes it's basically whoever goes first yes and i would rather have played sky striker than goki because at least going second i have a chance because i can draw like multiple hand traps or something like right. that and then stop them and win whereas if i was playing the goki mirror i just lose if i lose the die roll <laughs> did you enjoy the sky striker mirror because it was a very weird mirror match this guy yeah i it was the Sky Striker mirror for the longest time for me was very rewarding because mm-hmm. it was whoever managed their resources the best. Yes. Um, or whoever drew engage more. <laughs> I mean, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was very just two sides of it. Like your opponent, like and I, I went. Uh, it was at the two hundredth YCS. Mm-hmm. We're coming up on the two fiftieth right now. Yeah. Yeah, the two hundredth YCS. I got first after Swiss, uh-huh. and then I played against the eventual winner, Manav, and mm-hmm. he got sixty fourth. And he just engaged into engage multiple times in our match, and oh. I just lost. So <laughs> yes, I went yes. from going first place to get ba- losing in the first round of <laughs> top cut, uh, just because of like multiple engage from my opponent. And uh, there's just nothing you can do about that. So yeah, the sky striker mirror was definitely very volatile at times because it was, <laughs> it was. if you just got multiple engaged, there's nothing you could really do. It was. It was. Did you enjoy that format, by the way, as a whole? Yeah, I think I did. Yeah, because uh, I just really enjoyed the Sky Striker deck in, mm-hmm. in general. It's a deck that I enjoyed playing in tournament, but I think playing a Sky, I would never go to locals and play Sky Striker. That would be a miserable experience. <laughs> um, uh, but in a tournament setting, I really enjoyed playing Sky Striker. 
I thought that was very rewarding. To play. Did you like the Skyshaker Orcus? I think the second Skyshaker got mashed together with Orcus, all of us were like, what is happening? Like, this needs to end at some point. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just I, mean, became yeah scary. I definitely played <laughs> some of the Skyshaker cards in my Orcus deck too, because they were just too good not to play. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so then I, yeah, I was able to play the Orcus deck, which is also, mm-hmm. I'd say it's, it's definitely like in probably my top 10 favorite decks. I really enjoy that deck. It was. It was actually very, very cool. So um, you mentioned beating the mirror match, which I'm glad you did. I want to circle back to that. However, first I want to ask you, since we talked about um, playing like the best decks, but YCS Mexico City was played under the last ban list. And if I'm mm-hmm. not mistaken, you did not play the tier deck. Mm, yes, yes. So uh, what's up so, with that? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so me and my teammate Ryan Levine both played Kashira. Yes. And... Oh, uh, the reason for that mainly is that we had, I had not been playing at all. Ryan mm-hmm. had really not been playing at all. And <coughs> the tier lament mirror match is very dependent upon skill and your knowledge of the cards and matchup. Yes. And so I knew if I were to go, to go to that tournament and try to play tier lament against players who have been playing that deck for months, I would be at a significant disadvantage. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to put that on my teammates. So the best choice for me would to just be play Kashira and try to build the deck to beat Tier Element, mm-hmm. which we did up until we lost. Um, so okay. we got to use this is where we came up with like the three material Rise Heart thing mm-hmm. and just set things like Forbidden Lance to play around Book of Eclipse, and then we didn't lose to cards like Nibiru or Lava Golem, which were very very popular. Um, and then we also played the new Gravekeeper spell card. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, I saw that the inscription. Yeah, inscription, uh, which mm-hmm. effectively is like six copies of Dimensional Shifter, mm-hmm. uh, which you can draw going second, which is really cool. Uh, so you can start off just by playing it, calling no graveyard effects until the end of the next turn. Yeah. So your opponent's turn, they also have no graveyard effects. Mm-hmm. And that basically shuts down the, all their shufflers, is shuff, uh, their, their Soliac. Um, it basically shuts down everything so you can break their board. Mm-hmm. And because the thing that we found the that was the hardest was you could try to play into their board almost all the time unless they had Paralino face up the field spell because then mm-hmm. they would just use a shuffler and pop your guy. Yeah, they have but, an additional pop, which is stupid. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, but Inscription was able to shut that down to mm-hmm. where that didn't matter, and then you're able to just tear apart their entire board and set up a Rise Heart. Mm-hmm. And that's how we won most of our matches until top four where all of us lost the die roll, and then Ryan and I didn't draw Inscription or Shifter. Okay. And uh, games one or three and ended up losing. But it worked for most of that. I beat almost all the other... Um, uh, Ryan and I both beat all of the other tier limit decks mm-hmm. we played up until then. So, uh, yeah. So what was your thought process going into the next three, three you guys went to? Because you literally had to, since you said you traveled like from one to the other, you had to mm-hmm. prepare for one event. And then immediately like shift the entire <laughs> the entire mindset and go to the yeah. next event. So that Sunday after the event, mm-hmm. we literally sat in our hotel room playing New Hormat wait until our flights like the next day. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was like me, Ryan, Dominic Couch, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Steve Silverman, uh, Bowden, uh, Jesse, and uh, Jesse and I played and and, uh, and Vlad. Uh, mm-hmm. Vlad, they wanted to try the ninja deck, and so I was mm-hmm. playing my new Kashira deck because um, I knew that going into uh, this tournament, I would want to play the deck that set me up uh, for the most success. Mm-hmm. And because I had been playing the deck so much, I <coughs> thought that would and understood a lot of things about mm-hmm. it. It would give me a better chance versus other people who were also going to use it. Of course. Uh, so basically, I just thought, oh, if a lot of people play Kashira, mm-hmm. I'll just play it better than them. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, yeah, Ryan and so Ryan was also playing the Kashira deck because he planned to play it also. Mm-hmm. And Dominic was trying to play Flunder and <laughs> could not beat Ryan's Kashira deck. Yeah, I heard it's that funny. It's, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's funny that if, if, if Ryan had not beat the crap out of Dom's Flunder deck, he probably would have used Flunder 
at the 3v3 YCS, and he probably would not have won. Yeah, I mean, the, the no extra so, deck flunder. Well, that's yeah, no brain. extra deck flunder. That's, that's big brain, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, our, 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 our I didn't play on the same team with Bowden and Ryan at, at this event, because okay. uh, we already had teams made up prior to that. Yeah. Um, but we all played the same deck, Mm -hmm. and uh, our tournament experiences just went very differently, whereas we played, decided to main deck Nibiru. We still decided to go for our three material Arise and Pass with lots of support cards, and uh, my... One of, <laughs> it's very funny because for... Mm -hmm. we, exp we But the nights before, we went over how we thought the tournament would go. Would go. Mm -hmm. We were like, all right, people are going to do A, B, and C, we're going to do this. And for Ryan Bowden and Ashad, they got first after Swiss. Mm -hmm. And that the tournament ended basically exactly how we planned originally. A, B, and C happened for them. And they were able to win their matches because A, B, and C happened. Okay. For me and my team, the exact opposite happened. Oh my god. Where, whereas none of the things that were supposed to work the way I thought they were worked out for me. And... It was just like a very poor experience. So like we had like Nibiru and like for them, Nibiru was the best card in their deck yeah. all weekend. For me, it was the worst. Oh my so God. <laughs> uh, I was never, uh, my opponents always played around it or something very unfortunate that would happen would be my partner, Mike, uh, my teammate, Mike, uh, would lose the die roll. Yeah. And I would win my die roll. Yes. And I would open up with Nibiru in my hand and make a play pass to my opponent and then my mike's opponent would be playing and then mike would nibiru them right and so now my opponent knows that nibiru is in mike's of deck so course. probably knows nibiru is in my deck yes. and plays around nibiru and it just it was just very unfortunate how things worked out like that <laughs> oh my i didn't even think of that like do you uh, do you like 3v3s or are there they maybe not that great because of reasons like that uh, so that was <laughs> that was something that we didn't think about until right. after it happened. And then uh, when I mentioned it to Ryan, he's like, holy crap, I'm glad most of my opponents were dumb and did not pay attention to the other matches around me. <laughs> um, <laughs> True, yeah. But I, in general, I think 3v3s are, are very fun. I think playing with your friends, like Yu-Gi-Oh! I think Yu-Gi-Oh! at its core is more about the people than the actual game. Yes. And... I think me, like most people, I've made lifelong friendships and relationships through Yu-Gi-Oh! And being able to share a tournament with those people mm -hmm. uh, feels feels very good. And I think also it helps when you're pretty good at the game. Because mm -hmm. when you have three people <laughs> who are good, it's always going to be way less likely that all th like two of you are going to lose. So it puts you in a winning position uh, that way. Um, which, so from that perspective, I do like it, but I think the most important thing to me is being able to play mm -hmm. with like your friends and people who you've just really like bonded with over you. you of know? course. Yeah. Naturally. Of course. Um, so I would like to circle back to deck building and, um, mm -hmm. I guess my question would be like, when you choose to pick a deck, so we talked about that. Sometimes you would choose to play a meta deck, sometimes you wouldn't. But when you choose to to okay, this is my deck, I'm going to, I'm going to play this. Do you actually try to take a look at deck lists that people have already done well with to see maybe what are some of the issues you could fix or some things that you like or some ratios that you like? Or do you go completely like just from scratch? No, absolutely. I think I think it would be very ignorant of me to not take mm -hmm. advantage of the information people put out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I constantly will use things like Yu-Gi-Oh! Scope. I, are you familiar yeah. with Yu-Gi-Oh! Mm -hmm. Scope? Yep. Yeah, to look at the kinds of decks and cards people are playing. And that'll have influence over certain things like mm -hmm. my side deck. And of course, I will go on ID YouTube and uh, look at deck lists that people have put out. Or uh, if I don't do it, usually someone like in my like play group yeah. will share that. Usually it's Bowden because Bowden just looks at everything. And I usually <laughs> don't look That's at great. absolutely <laughs> everything. But I can usually go to Bowden and feel like, hey, what's happening with this? event or deck and he'll send me deck lists that people have been uh, using or whatnot mm -hmm. and then we'll all go over it and uh, try to use that information to make our decks 
uh, as optimal as possible. And uh, I think something else, and I didn't share this for a long time, yeah. but I've just grown to care less as I've gotten older. Mm-hmm. But I think like a really good resource you can use is looking, especially if you need some sort of, uh, if you're looking for inspiration on right. something, um, is to use uh, sp- also YouTube, but more specifically Twitter uh, mm-hmm. for the Japan what the Japanese do because the Japanese almost exclusively post things on Twitter. And you can just go to like you if you say you want to uh, look for innovation for your tier limit deck, you okay. can just go to uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! Wikia, copy like the Japanese word for tier limit, go put it into the search engine for Twitter, and then look at what all the Japanese people or all these different tournaments have been doing with their tier limit deck. And you can find like certain tech cards. And that's how originally how we found out about Brandon and High Spirits. And then yeah. we were able to to use that because we saw a Japanese deck that was playing it, mm-hmm. and we're like, "Oh, this is like could be kind of cool." And uh, I've gotten like a lot of like good inspiration from seeing like weird, obscure cards mm-hmm. that way. Even if like their decks that they play might not be like optimal, mm-hmm. it can be true of anything. Where like you can see like a certain card that would spark something in your brain like Mm -hmm. oh this there could be something here because there are definitely been times where i've like seen uh like youtube videos or people talking about decks and their deck probably isn't very good or built very well but they'll have like a random card in it and i'm like oh this card has potential probably not for the reasons this person thought but okay it's something worth looking into that's amazing i love this that's 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 great i I hope more people do this because it is a very very good idea and, oh. and even if, if you want, don't want to use it for deck building purposes, it's sometimes it's just fun to see what random decks the Japanese are playing that you don't mm-hmm. normally get to see. Because a lot of people will go on like uh, Road to the Road King and the stuff King, like yeah. that. But there's not a lot of resources on the, the road, uh, on Road to the King. Uh, in like yeah. one article, there's like two topping deck lists of the top mm-hmm. two most represented decks. So you would really need to jump through like 50 hoops to get to some other deck lists. So yeah, yeah, yeah. most definitely. So um, yeah, no, it's very cool. Another question I had: when you look at a deck and you choose you choose to play it, or maybe you look at at a, at a deck list, or like you said, you realize someone was their thought process behind choosing a card wasn't exactly correct. Maybe how do you go about determining which what are the issues in a deck and actually solving those issues? Whether that be the ratios or the, I don't know, there's too many normal summons I have to play or mm-hmm. not enough spots for deck cards or whatever it may be. How do you go about determining and solving issues? So I think the the easiest way to spot issues is, so <clears throat> this is something that I think might be different for me than <clears throat> someone like Jesse. Mm-hmm. Jesse hates playing Yu-Gi-Oh to figure out certain issues okay. issues with decks okay he'd rather go by theory and watching mm-hmm. people play mm-hmm. and i am much more hands-on and i usually like to play more to mm-hmm. figure out what kind of issues a deck has and i think this is something that m- that's probably how most people have to do they're more hands-on yeah um, so normally I just play a deck a crap load and then I start to st- they start to, over time realize like, okay, this is a problem. This is an issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, I just kind of discuss with like my friends, like, Hey, this is an issue. How can we go about dealing with this? And sometimes, uh, through like working together mm-hmm. and looking through things like, uh, through different cards, through uh, like dueling books, search engines, or mm-hmm. uh, whatever search engines you want to use for Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, we come up with solutions to that. Sometimes you don't, and I think that that's right now one of the issues with Castera is that none of us can figure out how to deal with that whole like rock paper scissors issue. Yes, and uh, it, I also like, like side note. This was like why I think the more hands-on approach is more beneficial than trying to theory is that Mm -hmm. uh, when Jesse was playing tier limits for YCS Mexico, Mm -hmm. he mostly had gone off theory about how the Kashtira matchup would go. And then once we went on Discord and were actually playing 
a lot of the things that Jesse thought were not true at all. And it's he realized like how bad his, his Kashira matchup actually was. Uh -huh. And so he, he had to decide that he probably had to side deck more cards for Kashira than actually uh, originally um, mm -hmm. thought he was going to have to. Uh, also, there was the issue of like, oh, like, do we main deck cards for Kashira or do we full blown try to beat the the tier limit mirror mm -hmm. and just forfeit game one to Kashdira. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the way they went where they made their decks worse against Kashdira, mm -hmm. but better against tier limit, um, because they figured to be way more tier limit than Kashdira. However, and same with Bowden for that event for, mm -hmm. for Mexico and Bowden actually in the, our last round of top four, mm -hmm. uh, got destroyed by, by Kashdira because oh. he had no cards for it. <laughs> so oh, no. It, <laughs> It's what it's one of those things that you have to decide when building your deck mm -hmm. is you have to make sacrifices sometimes. Yes. And sometimes those sacrifices don't pan out, sometimes they do. Hmm. That's very cool. I love this explanation. That's that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you can't always like uh how to put this, like you can't always figure everything out. It would just be mm. weird. Like you said, sacrifices. That was a very, very good word to explain all of that. So um <clears throat> what I was thinking as well, like when you when you when you're building a deck a lot of times people will say like mathematically this and this ratio is like perfect like sure. you should you should play like i don't know five normal summons and you can you should have like you know in a meta where you need to tech cards you should dedicate like 15 to 18 slots to tech cards and all of that like what are some of the ratios that you maybe if you do that at all that you would like go by you know every single time and just i guess yeah, you know respect and just be like that's that's what i need when i'm deck building like mm. purely mathematically so mathematically i do use like a hypogeometric calculator mm -hmm. uh to help with ratios specifically for uh like certain cards usually mm -hmm. it's like hand trap lineups right like uh so if i want to say all right if i'm going second i need like nine hand traps in my deck to see them x amount of time mm -hmm. um and stuff like that uh also it would be like uh for ratios of like again like you said for normal summons like i mm -hmm. want x amount of normal summons and i want to see them this many times mm -hmm. and i'll use the calculator for that mm -hmm. um other than that i think it is very deck dependent mm -hmm. ratio what your ratio should be mm -hmm. and i don't think there's any a hundred percent mathematical okay. like go to when it comes to certain things I, so mm -hmm. if anyone tells you like oh this is the way it should be mm -hmm. anyone who speaks in definite definitives i yes. would be hard pressed to take them seriously uh, i think it's all uh, nothing is black and white I, if someone sees things as black and white i probably won't take that person seriously uh there's always a gray area and right. uh, I, I, it always depends on the deck that you have and what you're trying to accomplish. Because mm -hmm. um, uh, like with our, our cashier deck that we played at Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, certain ratios of cards, like we knew that we needed X amount of cards going second that functioned against tier limit. Right. Uh, but that's specifically because the format was the way it was. Yeah. If tier limit wasn't a thing, we wouldn't need those cards mm -hmm. and the math would be much different. Right. Um, how do you, that's another thing I'm, I'm very interested to, to ask you, how do you determine card quality when you look at a card Art quality? Yeah. Like when you look at a card and you go, is like, this card is 100% something I need to test because it seems mm -hmm. like it has a ton of potential. Um, so I think it's less of something that I try to do and just something that has become very uh, kind of like, a like secondhand nature yeah, for yeah, me yeah. over time mm -hmm. because i am so familiar with cards and because my like knowledge of the card database is so vast mm -hmm. a lot of times i can read a card and instantly realize oh this card is good because of this random dumb card that came out <laughs> three years ago yes. um and that is also a reason why i think in the past i was have done very well with mm -hmm. innovation because mm -hmm. I'm able to see a card when it comes out and think, oh, this card does something. Yes. And one of the things was I was one, the very first person to like put Torghide in their deck uh, before Xyz Monsters came out. Yes. Just because I realized this, as soon as I read it, I said, this card gets Sangen and Sangen is super broken right now. So Torghide gets Sangen, Sangen gets every other card in my deck. 
this card is broken. <laughs> and then uh, I played it at an event and I went like X2 and bubbled a YCS. And then after that, Tour Guide went. I remember going to my locals and telling people I wanted Tour Guide. And they were like, why do you want this card? Like, they just couldn't understand why it was any good. And I said, oh, I just want it because the art looks good. Because <laughs> no I, way. I did, a lot of times back <laughs> then, people would not trade me or sell me cards because mm -hmm. they were worried I was going to make it worth money. So I had to, like, I swindle cannot. people into <laughs> yeah, you kept them getting in the me to trade their cards. <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, oh, I just like the art of this card. But, and then, like, later, like, Tori went from a $30 card to a $100 card. And, um... <laughs> So yeah, I, I think evaluating <laughs> card quality is something I'm very, very, very good at. Mm -hmm. um, that I can just read cards and pretty pretty easily dictate if a card is good or not. Mm -hmm. um, very rarely do I read a card and if, think it's bad and that ends up being good, I would say. I'm sure it's happened, but it, it, I can't remember the last time I th thought something was bad and then it was actually crazy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I think, I and that, think uh, but th and that just comes with experience. I, of course, uh, over time, I don't think it's something that you actively have to work on. I think it's over time as you familiarize yourself with cards mm -hmm. um, that you, people will grow at and, and, mm -hmm. and playing as well. So, I mean, I think it's also important, like to just to just give the cards a chance. Like whenever a set comes out, like just take the time, like literally take an hour and just read the cards. Like, it's not going to cost you anything. And you might, mm. you know, remember a card like down the line. Like you said, oh, a couple years ago, this card came out. I, I acquired a play set because I figured it might be interesting. And now I can use it. So I think a lot of times people just, um, they just like to be lazy. And they just wait for deck lists. And they just wait for, mm. you know, stuff like that. Like tech cards. Oh, that's a thing. Okay, cool. I'm going to just get it now and and just they don't want to put any thought into it like i'm not saying you need to be innovative because it's insanely hard but like just right. give the cards a chance i guess you know yeah no absolutely and i think that's actually something that a lot of people who <clears throat> a, a lot of my friends and stuff who are good at Yu Gi Oh, a lot of them don't go ahead and read all the new cards when they get released in japan mm -hmm. but it's one of my favorite things to do because i like building decks and mm -hmm. anytime something new comes out in Yu-Gi-Oh, it excites me because my brain gets to go all stupid and think about <laughs> dumb combos and stuff like that. So, like, when I saw, like, uh, there was this card, Apple Dragon, which got announced a couple weeks ago or, like, a month ago. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I saw that card, I said, this card is crazy. And I made a combo video with it and I told everyone on Twitter, this card is nuts. And uh, now it's, like, out, yeah. <laughs> and, and now it's a very, 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 very strong card in Japan right now. Mm -hmm. Um and so I would strongly advise if you want to uh, get better at evaluating cards, just read them. It takes 10 minutes to go and just read all the new cards that come out whenever they get shown. So, mm -hmm. Are there any cards that you prefer in your strategy? Like sometimes, you know, you will see decks built like uh, we saw, for example, with Sprite was a great example of just a deck that could play power spells and really omit hand traps almost all together to combat mm -hmm. the meta that way. Is there a particular preference you maybe have when it comes to deck cards, like what, what you like to use or how you like to build decks utilizing those cards in a certain meta? <clears throat> um, I think probably... So my first instinct was to say, no, I don't really have a preference. Mm -hmm. But when I look back at decks I've played over the years, I mm -hmm. really do enjoy, like I said, the more control and mm -hmm. mid-range matchups where like you can use hand traps and mm -hmm. it, it doesn't feel bad. But I think, it, again, it's entirely format dependent where sometimes hand traps are just really, really bad and they don't do enough. And you have to mm -hmm. admit them for like really strong cards. Um, so mm -hmm. I, don't, I think in general, I don't have a preference, but I do it. I, in the past, I have definitely enjoyed decks more that have been able to use the uh, hand traps. All right. Fair. Because you said you're not really into combo decks and stuff like that. So I figured I would, I would ask that because I think it's, um, it, 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 it takes a huge amount of skill, I think, to play any type of deck, whether that be combo mid range or whatever. However, when it comes to those mid range and control decks, sometimes to me, it seems even harder because almost anyone can learn to just do a combo. And sometimes a combo is going to be so stupidly busted that you're winning just off of that combo. And, and that's just what it is. And we've mm -hmm. seen those types of decks, but with decks like Sky Striker, for example, like, I don't think if you're not really, um, 
a, a very good player or practicing enough, you I don't think you can master a deck like like Strike Striker, for example. No, absolutely, and and I think so. For for example, at uh, the YCS in Vegas, mm-hmm. uh, I was uh, in the one of the last rounds uh, of of Swiss, and I was going second in game three against the Kashtir Amir, mm-hmm. and he drew Ibli with the lock five combo, mm-hmm. and it was one of those things where like, all right, he knew how to do that, and he had the hand, and I yes. didn't do anything, and exactly. I just lost. Exactly. Um, and th- there are always going to be instances of of decks like that, and. Of course, the decks with control and mid range uh, are always going to fall into a category of being um, uh, I guess less forgiving uh, mm-hmm. when you mess up mm-hmm. because they have a uh, a lower ceiling. So you have this lower ceiling of things that you can do yes. on a whole, mm-hmm. but you're able to control the things down here and keep them at your level mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Where, um but if you mess up the decks that go high can yeah. capitalize on that way easier mm-hmm. and just overwhelm you on your small mistake whereas the decks with the high ceiling can ha- make some mistakes but because their ceiling is so high it is mi- it mitigates that and yeah. it, it it's it, harder it to like capitalize on that yeah mm-hmm. Right, yeah, my opponent could, yeah, exactly. Like in the Kashira deck, like my opponent could play one card wrong, but as long as they can lock enough zones, yes. uh, it, it probably doesn't matter if they made a mistake. Yeah, no, of course. And it's also much more rewarding to play the other types of decks where like at the point in time when you slow the game down to your pace, like the pace of your deck, like they cannot do anything. It's just over. Mm-hmm. It's over. Right. The second you control that, 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 it's just, it's just done. And, um, yeah, since we mentioned you mentioned the mirror match and we talked about the mirror match before, like um I've I've I'm so hyped to to be talking about this because mirror matches are such a weird topic. Like some people mm-hmm. enjoy them, like they just enjoy the hell out of them and they just want to play mirror matches and they love them. Whether that's because they like to innovate when it comes to deck building in the mirror match or just because it skill matters like it did in the tier format. Um, what's your thoughts on the entire like mirror match thing? Do you like it? How do you prepare for it? All of that. So it's weird. Uh I enjoyed playing the Sky Striker Mirror when Sky Striker was out. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's also because I didn't have to play against Sky Striker every round. Mm-hmm. And so when I did play against Sky Striker, I was like, oh, this is fun. I can play it better than my opponent or mm-hmm. whatnot. And it, and it was great. But I think it would get very monotonous to play Sky Striker, Sky Striker, Sky Striker mm-hmm. every round. And uh, same with like Tier Limit. Like yeah. for me to play Tier Limit and have to play Tier Limit every round. That would just drive me crazy, especially tournament with the Shizu cards, because mm-hmm. you always had to get up to like chain like 20 or whatever. And both yeah. players are milling infinite cards and you have to keep track of all the names that are used. And mm-hmm. uh, it seems more of a chore to do that <laughs> than actually than actually having fun. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so in general, I would I have enjoyed mirrors in the past, but they tend to be in formats that are diverse. Mm-hmm. where I don't have to play the mirror all of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, if I had to play the mirror all the time, I would probably not like that very much. <laughs> fair. That's fair. Um, how do you prepare for it when you're choosing cards to counter the mirror? It's always going to be very dependent on the the kinds probably of decks. The, yeah, the type of deck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think it, preparing for a mirror match would be... Um, dependent on the, the format as a whole so before we go into tournaments mm-hmm. um almost always my friends and i try to go over how many of each deck we think we'll play in swiss mm-hmm. so we'll like all right i think i'll play like three of this deck three of this deck two of this deck and then like a random deck that like that really like a random deck that isn't any of them mm-hmm. and based on that information that we decide usually by using things like tournament results and Yu-Gi-Oh scope. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how we decide to build our, our side decks and stuff like that. So if I think I'm going to play, if I'm playing Kashtira and I think I'm going to play against four Kashtira mirrors, um, which would be, if I had nine rounds of Swiss, it would be close to 50% of so my tournament. Half. I probably yeah. want to have extra cards in my main deck or side deck for the mirror. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, 
to prepare for that tournament. But if I think I'm only going to play like two mirror matches, I'm probably not going to lean as heavily into that for my my main deck mm-hmm. and my side deck or specifically my main deck. And I might go heavier for it in my side deck because maybe uh, the mirror match is like more swingy. So like in Kashtira, mm-hmm. uh, the mirror match is definitely going to be swingy because it is dependent upon uh, if your opponent has like all of these cards like Nibiru, Lava Golem, whatever. So mm-hmm. you have to like side deck a lot of cards that will fit all the situations that you need to not just instantly lose the game. Mm-hmm. Um, not every deck is going to be like that, but it, it, it's, it'd be similar to where in Sky Striker, if I thought I was going to play against three Sky Striker mirrors, I probably wanted some very swingy cards. So like back then, Shared Ride was like a yeah, super blowout Shared card Ride. Yeah. In, in, in the mirror. So if I'm going first, I probably want that card because mm-hmm. it's like maxing my opponent's Sky Striker deck. It was insane. Shared yeah. Ride was so, so absurd in that, that <laughs> format. It was wild. Um, so uh, I think we are pretty much done however i would still want to mention your podcast we briefly mentioned it before yeah and uh like you know plug yourself what's what's up with podcast yeah <laughs> yeah sure so so me and my friends and teammates uh ryan levine and bone temnik have a podcast that we try to do once a week sometimes mm-hmm. it's not once a week because we're traveling or something like that mm-hmm. But yeah, we just talk about with everything that's going on with Yu-Gi-Oh! right now and our tournaments and what we think about cards and stuff like that. And uh, it's really where if you want to see what some like high level players are talking about, mm-hmm. as long as like being pretty chill, uh, go course. and check us out. It's the J- JRB podcast and you can find us on Spotify and YouTube and, and all that good stuff. So please check us out. Well, I'm most definitely going to put all of the links, the links, all of your socials, the podcast, everything in the description oh, box you. so you guys can find <laughs> it easily. I think it's great. Overall, just looking at how many pro players are getting into content creation, it's literally like, you know, how do we deserve that? It's amazing. Thank you to have as many resources as possible, especially because we talked about before how we're in an era of sharing information. Like, I think it's mm. great. So you guys most definitely need to check them out. And um I think that's going to be it for today. I had, it, it was amazing. I had so much fun and it was a pleasure being able to host you on, on this. So, um, yeah, any no, closing thank you thoughts? So much for, <laughs> no, thank you so much for having me. Uh, <laughs> if you ever need someone to come back and talk about something, I'd be more than glad to do that for you. Um, oh. You've been very kind and <laughs> I would love, I, as I've gotten older, I've loved to talk about Yu-Gi-Oh! I'd like to talk about Yu-Gi-Oh! more than mm-hmm. when I did when I was younger. When I was mm-hmm. younger, I just wanted to play and keep stuff to myself and be <laughs> secretive and try to hide all the stuff. But <laughs> but now I think it's uh, I think it's great to try and uh, be out there more and, and talk about my experiences mm-hmm. and talk about Yu-Gi-Oh! with people. So uh, I definitely enjoy it more, which is why we started the podcast is of uh, just talking about Yu-Gi-Oh! and putting information out there and because it's something that we we all love and it's something that connects us all and i think that's like really important thank you i appreciate it a lot and like i said it was it was great to have you and i would love to host you more um you would need to come back like <laughs> that's, just, that's just what <laughs> no, it is no absolutely you're coming back <laughs> no but for real um thank you guys for watching if you enjoyed this please let us know in the comments make sure to check out you know the podcast to check out all of just socials and all of that and of course like the video, sub to the channel, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.